Good day to all my students. In Introduction to Music Class 110, uh, today we're going to talk about the Renaissance. We have left the medieval period moving toward the Renaissance, and there's a few things that I want to uh, start off with. And I'm looking at my computer over here. I pulled up the PowerPoint that I'm going to load that uh, you guys can look at. The very first slide talks about the progression of music through the Middle Ages to the Renaissance. And I just want to touch on that briefly, because as we talk about the progression of music, remember around the 4th century or the 6th century, around that area, we began with a single line of music. Uh, it was called monophonic chant. Uh, it was from the church. After that, it evolved into a more complex form of multiple lines called melismatic chant. The monophonic was just that. It was one note per syllable. Melismatic was several notes per syllable to give it more of a melodic feel. And then they added a thing called a drone, which was just a simple one note instrument playing in the background. And playing one note and singing allows you to have harmony occurring at certain points, but it's not really planned out. Then we came uh, around the 12th century, had early attempts at polyphony, adding multiple voices, multiple lines, and adding instruments. Uh, we talked about Guillaume de Machaut, who created the mass and used polyphonic techniques from guys named Lynn and Periton. Uh, and then after that, you had the beginning of the Crusade period. And with the Crusades came an opening as thousands of Europeans traveled to the Middle East through Eastern Europe and on down in the Middle East and across North Africa. Uh, travel always seems to open cultures up to change and the Crusades for all the horrors were no different. And I think I mentioned in the previous lecture that we always hear people talk today about how evil and brutal the Crusades were and then they point a finger at the church. Well, the church did start the Crusades, but it wasn't necessarily a Christian church. Uh, six crusades from Europe into the Middle East to recapture Jerusalem compared to 1,100, yes, 1,100 crusades from Islam coming into Europe. And the, in the 13th century, they even managed to uh, capture and hold about half of Spain. Uh, one Muslim crusade went all the way up almost to Paris. Uh, later, the Ottoman Empire, which was the Muslim Empire, uh, they made it all the way to the gates of Vienna. So we we love to tell history and pick on the person we think are bad. In this case, lately, it's been religion and the church. But there's two sides to the story. And you would think that with six crusades compared to 1,100 crusades, you would see Islam as the aggressor. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of revisionist historians don't see that. <clears throat> but with this mixing of cultures came new types of music, new types of uh, instrumentation, uh, new scales even, as they began to adopt some of the minor sounds uh, in the, of the Middle East. With that, also, you have everything from cultural influence, new ways of wearing clothes, new foods. Uh, a new language and trade. Now, at the same time, uh, it wasn't always the friendliest people. Like I said, you had 1,100 incursions of Muslim armies into Europe, not to mention what's known as the period of Saracen pirates. The Saracens was just a word for Muslim, and you had pirates raiding all along south of France, uh, Italian coastline, uh, and so there was a lot of, a lot of problems. Now, at the same time, <clears throat> all of these cultural influences are being enmeshed into European culture. You have uh, Jewish people moving from Eastern Europe all over to Western, even the Great Britain. You have gypsies from largely what is today Romania and, and Northern Greece. They began to follow the Crusaders in the Middle East and then back into Europe, all the way into France. And so they brought with them their own variety of music, which was usually very lively and rhythmic. 
And so as the culture changes, the music changes. Uh, we have the introduction of secular music in the late Middle Ages. And a lot of people believe that this is what led to the Renaissance. The church had held power. And during the latter part of the uh, Middle Ages, the Crusades sort of stripped them of power because people realized that they had gone, they had fought, they had killed, they had done some pretty horrible things and had some pretty horrible things done to them. And a lot of soldiers just said, this is not godly. And they turned their back on the church and they became more secularist. Uh, their music became more love songs and songs about everyday life. The church tried to exert control and stop it, but they really couldn't stop it. Uh, and with them came a whole new class of people, traveling performers, probably gypsies. They called them jongleurs uh, in the French. But all of this came and it opened the society up, not only for more secularization, but trade. Because they found things in the Middle East they wanted and they couldn't get them in Europe. Primarily things like spices coming from the Indies, or India, I should say, uh, silk from China. Uh, this led to people like Marco Polo in the 12th century going, looking for a market. And it made Italy, particularly places like Venice and, not, pardon me, not Venice, but uh, Florence, Milan. Uh, uh, I think there was another place that did, and it just skipped my mind there. But Italian cities, particularly in the north, um, were became market centers. And the cities were governed uh, by the nobility, but the nobility was basically businessmen, bankers, this sort of thing. Uh, and so that opened this all up. The, I'm going to change the slide. The next slide you'll see, slide two, is, is one that says the Renaissance. It gives the date to 1450 to 1600, a rough date. And there's uh, several things on this. Uh, everything from the meaning of the word to social reaction to creativity to the dominant philosophy. I don't want you to spend a lot of time on this slide when you look at it because I'm going to take these and I'm going to sort of pull them out in the next few slides. So I move to the next slide and there we see some characteristics. Uh, the primary characteristic of the Renaissance was the word itself, which means rebirth. The question not often asked though is rebirth of what? Uh, they didn't want to go back to the previous Middle Ages. They felt like that was just too closed off. Uh, they didn't want to go back to the age of Rome. So you have to assume that they looked around, they saw the cultures of education, art, beauty, and suddenly it's like, this, these are the Greeks. Uh, the Greek culture was full of education, art, and beauty, and the, the buildings were still standing. So Renaissance basically was a time to give rebirth to the Greek idea the Greek idea of art and beauty and that sort of thing. And we'd already taken the modal idea of the music and applied it to modern music. That's where we get our scales. There were, I forget how many modes of the Greeks used up to 14 at one point. We sort of scaled it down to basically major and minor and seven scales. Uh, one thing you have to realize is that the Renaissance was a reaction to the Middle Ages. The Middle Ages had been pretty stagnant. Everything was shut down, controlled by the church. Now the people were seeking to be active, involved, and freer. And so when you give man freedom, some incredible things happen. This whole era has been called the era of creativity and exploration. Uh, <clears throat> the next slide is just a picture of a palace. But what I was doing here is I'll show you, this was one of the Medici palaces, and it's built on a Greek pattern of construction. So they're doing everything from art to architecture in the Greek style. Next slide is one that you want to look at for a second because I talked about the age of exploration. Just like the Crusades and people traveling through Northern Africa, Eastern Europe, Middle East, opened up their minds, their taste buds, and their ears to all kinds of new things, people began to explore. Now on this page, you will see pictures of some guys. Some of them are household names. Some you may not be familiar with. But that first one up in the left-hand corner is Marco Polo. Beside him is a guy named Bartolomeu Diaz. And beneath him, of course, you recognize or you may recognize Christopher Columbus. In the lower left-hand corner to the far left is Ferdinand Magellan. 
and beside him is Vasco da Gama. Now, the importance of these people was that we know that Marco Polo opened up trade route. He did this in the 12th century. Uh, they wanted to get to India. They wanted to get the spices, the cloth, all those things. They needed a route. Well, they couldn't go down through the Suez Canal because there was no Suez Canal. To go overland was very dangerous. You had to have a caravan that was well armed. And even then you'd be raided and attacked by various warlords. So the logical thing was, let's find a sea route. So you had people like uh, Bartolomé Diaz, who thought he would sail under Africa and come up in the Indian Ocean, which he attempted. However, he didn't make it. He turned back before he rounded the Cape around uh, Africa, South Africa. But what he did was he found uh, a navigation school. I mean, he founded it. I said that improperly. He started navigation school because he had found that the currents were different below the equator than they were above the equator. He found that there were uh, certain wind patterns instead of just your typical wind pattern that came up the Atlantic in the wintertime. And so he put all that down. He began to teach people uh, on how to navigate and to travel in these oceans. Uh, he didn't do it himself, but he taught people to do it. Probably the most successful one at that was... Uh, Vasco da Gama and Ferdinand Magellan uh, as guys who will eventually circumnavigate the globe. Uh, the one we think about the most is Columbus because Columbus decided he would sail west to get to the east because he thought, well, the, the globe, the earth is a globe. Uh, there's a lot of people called the Flat Earth Society that say, well, the earth is flat. Uh, all this stuff we see from space is made up. And at the time, these people thought the Earth was flat. Well, that's what we've been taught. But logic would sort of argue the point, because if you're a sailor, you know that if you climb up into the crow's nest, you can see beyond the horizon, which would imply that the Earth is not flat, but it is curvature. If you stand in a tower at the ocean's edge and look out to sea, you may see a ship that the person standing on the ground can't see because it's below the horizon. So they knew the earth was curved. Uh, they knew that it was probably a globe. But like I said, one priest in one book wrote the four corners of the earth, and they assumed, well, if it has four corners, it must be flat. And the church took that as the official doctrine, and the church had the power. Columbus argued the point, and of course, we know the story. He sailed west. He came to America thinking it was India. And so he called it the Indies. Uh, today, revisionist historians are giving Columbus a hard time because they say, well, you know, he, he owned slaves and he was a terrible man. Uh, the reason we celebrate Columbus, by the way, is not that he found America. Uh, America wasn't lost, it just hadn't been visited. And we do know that there were people here before the Vikings in 1000 uh, showed up on the north. But the big difference with Columbus and Vikings and maybe even some Chinese and on the West Coast was that he set up a colony that was successful in the Indies. Uh, he also was governor for a while of that place. He was able to establish a foothold in the Americas. He may not have discovered something that was lost. He just simply found something that they didn't know existed. It, it wasn't lost. It just, they didn't know it was there. So, Columbus should still be celebrated because he did what none of the others could do before. He established a lasting presence. And yes, he did have slaves. But if we're going to kick out everybody in history that had slaves, uh, we're going to have a pretty empty book of history. Slavery is not good. It wasn't good then. It's not good now. Uh, but I don't see anybody rushing to get rid of pinto beans because people who ate pinto beans had slaves. I don't see them rushing to get rid of cloth because the cloth was picked and made by slaves. So it's like, we're going to revise history and, and get rid of people, but we're not going to get rid of the things that came about through slavery. And my point is, it's a little bit silly to do that. Uh, we all know today, we've come to the Enlightenment, of realizing that slavery was bad. It was bad then. It's bad still. And yet, you know, it still goes on in North Africa. 
in Libya is one of the largest slave markets in the world, but nobody talks about it. They come to America and say, let's punish anybody who had an ancestor or let's punish any historical figure. Why aren't they saying, let's go punish the slave traders in Libya who sell children every day? Just my point of view. Uh, but anyway, what happened here with all these men? These explorers opened the world up. And what they did was they brought back even more things. And it made people hungry for new things, for education, uh, all sorts of, like I said, food, clothing, instrumentation. It greatly affected the world of music. Uh, the next slide is rather important, I think. It's Renaissance thought. Up to this point, the church had controlled everything, including the way people thought and what they thought about. In the Renaissance, a philosophical idea came into being. <clears throat> Some people try to say, well, it was a philosophy of anti-church. It was anti-institution, but it was not anti-God. The dominant philosophy of the day, you'll see on this slide, is humanism. And the simple definition of this type of humanism it was a focus on man's accomplishments. But what you have to understand is the men that were making the accomplishments gave the credit to God. They were people who believed in God, and they believed that God had given them special abilities to accomplish certain things. So it was not an atheistic humanism. Today, most humanists are either agnostic or atheistic. But this was early humanism. It wasn't secular humanism. It was more of a religious type of humanism. Uh, they believed in morality, a human-based morality of good and evil. But guess what? It's based on the Ten Commandments. It's still coming from the Bible, which is the center of our process of ethical behavior. Uh, they had a philosophy based on values and behavior that brought out the best of humanity, not the worst. Uh, they didn't necessarily yield to a supernatural authority in a lot of things they did, they sort of split their sails into their spiritual person and their physical person. The sailor was still rough and rowdy and went to war, but he prayed to God before he did anything. It's not unlike things today. This idea, this humanistic idea, still pervades today. Uh, and yet, in it, there was this real concern for the furtherance of humanity and for people. Um, it was a cultural, secular movement, um, and intellectual, but it wasn't the abject abolishment of religion, because you'll notice during this time, churches were doing fine. Uh, what they lost was their, their power of governmental control, but they were still there as a major influence. The last term on this sheet is Renaissance man. A Renaissance man is what we call the people of this day, the nobility especially, they were trained in every aspect and every art. They could sing, they could play instruments, but they also were trained in war, fighting. Uh, and some of these men were, were great warriors, generals, but they were also great businessmen. So if you have someone who is very good at many skills, we call him a Renaissance man. Uh, the colloquial term today is a jack of all trades, but that's just a throwback to the Renaissance man. Uh, the next slide is about the Gutenberg Press, which the Gutenberg Press was like their internet. Suddenly, information was flowing faster and freer because it was being printed. Uh, Gutenberg, a typical Bible, let me say, to be written by the church took anywhere from six to nine months with priests sitting and copying manuscripts. Gutenberg could crank out 50 of them in a week with his press, and he did make Bibles. Interestingly enough, the church said, stop doing that. But when you think about great inventions that really open up the culture, society, and the world, the Gutenberg Press has to be one of your big ones. Because, like I said, it was the source of information. More information, more education. More education, people can do more. I also wanted to put in here an art trend. Uh, I mentioned on the next slide... Filippo Brunelleschi, not a very flattering picture of him, but this is a guy that was an artist, and in the Middle Ages, the church wanted everything to be flat, one-dimensional, because they felt if it were too realistic, you'd be trying to uh, take the place of God. 
And so they said it needs to be. So that's why you'd have a castle and the king would be standing beside it. He'd be as tall as the walls. Uh, they weren't interested in reality. They didn't want realism in the early Middle Ages. But here it, it totally changed. Now it was like we need to paint things as they are. Reality. Uh, nudity in the Middle Ages was totally forbidden. In the Renaissance, they said, wait a minute, God created us naked. We should paint people as, as they were made by God. So Brunelleschi comes up with the idea of perspective. He looked at a building, this building on the next slide. It was an eight-sided baptistry in Florence. And he realized when you're standing at one side and look at it, the other side looks shorter. But if you stood in front of them, then the tallest one now looks shorter. And he came up with this concept of perspective. Things farther away look smaller, up close they're bigger. And that one thing just changed art completely. Um, next slide, I show an example of Middle Ages one perspective painting and a Brunelleschi style painting. And you can look at those and understand it. Uh, on the next slide, I have a picture of the Botticelli birth of Venus. And I wanted to point out here, uh, not only is Venus just about naked, but it reveals a lot of what the idea of beauty was. You'll notice that Venus is not your classical beauty of today. She has a little pot belly and sort of wide at the hips and narrow shoulders. Got pretty hair. But what they're pointing out is this is a woman that was considered good at childbearing, particularly if you have wide hips, you have sons. And that was one of the goals. And you see her lady-in-waiting. She has humongous hips. Uh, but here we see the cultural ideas of the day reflected in this painting by Botticelli. Uh, next, another great leader in art was Michelangelo. And I'll show you some pictures here on the next slide of the Sistine Chapel. Uh, Michelangelo <clears throat> was a bit of a rebel. Uh, he was a sculptor who was forced to be a painter. He didn't want to be a painter. He wanted to be a sculptor. But the church put pressure on him, and he gave us one of the great masterpieces of all time uh, as he paints the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. Uh, in this, you'll see some of his protests in that he has some pictures that are sort of rude. Uh, like if you see one character is actually mooning. Uh, but some of the more important things are what he hid in his paintings. For instance, in the next slide, it's God imparting life to man. And look at how man is represented and how God is represented. Man is represented, even though he's this big, muscular guy, he's sitting back, he has to prop his arm up on his knee. He's just so weak, his wrist is bent, he is lazy. Yet God is active, and God is reaching out to him. Man's not reaching up to God, God's reaching out to man, and that was the message. But what's always made people question this painting is, God is surrounded by the heavenly host, but where are they? What is that purple thing that we see in this painting? Um, and anecdotal story says that uh, one day on a tour of the Sistine Chapel, there was the question posed as, what is the purple thing? And somebody said, well, it's a pomegranate. It's the forbidden fruit. But there was a brain surgeon. He said, it's the human brain. And this is how he sort of explained it. Uh, he said, I can see the sulcus, the pituitary gland, the spinal cord, uh, the pons deferens. And turns out it oddly does look like a human brain and that God is in the mind of men. Uh, that led to a whole big debate. And uh, it, it almost got Michelangelo in some trouble. But we see that there. We see another painting of this, this man upside down. And we see the neck, and the same surgeon said, well, that's another painting of the brain, just from a different angle. Uh, if it's true, now, it could be just uh, what is apophenia, where you see what you want to see. Uh, but could it be Michelangelo giving us some message about God, his theology, and art? Uh, these are some of the sculptures of Michelangelo. Of course, the David and the Madonna and Child. The, these were pretty well known, and they're still around today. I'd like to see him myself. The next guy that I want to focus on as a Renaissance artist is Leonardo da Vinci. And we know him as a painter. Uh, but if you looked at his resume then, he was probably better known as a uh, weapons designer. 
he did a lot of that. Design web sort of. But, but the two pictures here, one is the Last Supper, one is uh, La Gioconda or the Mona Lisa. And these are considered great masterpieces. There was a lot made about the Last Supper, if you remember Dan Brown and the Da Vinci Code. Um, that, by the way, was not a new theory. That's about a thousand years old, and it's not really true. Uh, La Gioconda is interesting because there was a graduate student several years back who was studying the picture and found a self-portrait of Michelangelo. And when she superimposed it, she, she flipped them. And it turns out that Mona Lisa may be a self-portrait of Michelangelo just without the beard and as a woman. Uh, because they never knew who Mona Lisa was. La Gioconda, that person didn't exist, according to the city records. So that would be an interesting thing. But like I said, Da Vinci was a weapons designer. And here's some of the weapons on the next slide. <coughs> this is slide 19 that he invented. He had a mock-up of what we would call a helicopter. And people, you laughed about it, but they tried it at the Air Force Academy. And they found that if he had had a motor, that thing would have lifted you off the ground. Uh, the other thing on the right-hand corner and above is his version of a tank with guns sticking all around and a cover placed over a cart, and there was oxen pulling in, and it could rotate and fire. Uh, bottom left-hand corner, you see a early multiple firing, what he would call a machine-type gun, where you could fire 10 or 12 weapons simultaneously. And, of course, his most famous was the wings that he attached to a young man to see if man could fly. Uh, his design is actually accurate. The problem was he based it on man and bird, and it turns out a bird's muscles are stronger than a man's because it can support its own weight, whereas a man can't. So when he changed it to a glider, it worked. But this is a man who is definitely thinking outside the box all the time, uh, which leads me to another guy. This is Rene Descartes. Now, Descartes is someone that you don't often hear a lot about. You hear about his big quote there, Cogito ergo sum, which means I think, therefore I am. But the reason I put him here in the Renaissance is this attitude and this idea becomes what we call a paradigm shift in thinking because Descartes began to argue on the nature of reality and truth. And he said, how do I know I even exist? And that's where he came up with this. He said, I'm, I'm thinking. I'm thinking about this. That means that I'm here. I think, therefore I am. That may not seem like a big deal to you, but suddenly it put reality into a, a different understanding of being able to explain reality. Before, you just took it for granted. But Descartes leads us into a world of what is truth. Truth is the thought. You're having the thought. So, he is a, a major figure in the shift in philosophical thought. That's why I put him there. All of this is occurring in the Renaissance. Uh, this was a period where it seemed like everybody's eyes, ears, and minds opened up. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, I've got a dry throat. The next slide, slide number 21, uh, this is sort of what puts an end to the Renaissance, uh, the Protestant Reformation. Now, the Catholic Church had control, but the Catholic Church was doing some things that a lot of people disagreed with, such as you could pay money to be forgiven for sin. It was called the selling of absolution. Um, it made a lot of money for the church at a time when they needed money. They wanted to build a new palace and that sort of thing. But this guy stood up, Martin Luther, and he said, well, this is wrong. And the Pope tried to arrest him, and the princes of Germany said, we sort of like this guy, and we like the idea that you don't pay absolution, and you don't pay your taxes to the church. There was a lot behind it. But suddenly there was a war between the Catholics, which is now called the Roman Catholics, and the Protestants who were protesting. They too had been Catholics. Uh, Luther was a priest. But now they were kicked out of the church. And this began the Protestant movement. So today, if you don't go to a Catholic church, a Roman Catholic church, then more likely you're a Protestant. And there's dozens of denominations from Baptist to Methodist to Presbyterian to Episcopalians to Pentecostals to Assemblies. Uh, all these people are Protestants. The problem was, in the war, Catholics were killing Protestants, Protestants were killing Catholics, uh, and while they were fighting, 
the Ottoman Empire advanced from Turkey into Europe all the way to Venice, uh, and they were basically going to take over. They had to have a peace treaty to stop killing Christians so they could fight the Muslim invaders. And when they went back, the, the peace treaty held. Um, you could spend a whole year talking about the Protestant Reformation, what it meant. But that leads us, brings us to chat to slide 22. And you may be thinking, well, when are we talking about music? Well, here it is. The Renaissance music, with all this new stuff going on culturally and everywhere else, um, the Renaissance music reflects all of this. Remember, one of the main things I've said earlier is that music is a reflecting force in culture. And we see it here. It was coming out of the churches, going into the royal courts, into the streets, into the bars and taverns. There was more instruments being played. They'd come from all over the world. And number three on this list is highlighted. It's called word or text painting. This was a compositional technique. And it's pretty ingenious because now you have songs that are written. And the words, the songs, they try to portray the what the words are saying in the sound of the music. An example of that is one of the songs that I'll probably post. It's called As, Vest As Vesta Was Descending. And it's a song about these people playing on the side of Mount Olympus. And they see gods and goddesses coming up and down Olympus. And so when they say, As Vesta Was Descending, they have notes that go down the scale. And then someone else was ascending. They have notes going up the scale. Um, they have someone saying, we sang two by two, three by three, then all together. And you see two voices, three voices. And then they have someone singing that I was in the garden all alone. And that's a solo voice. This is text painting. And it's a technique that all the writers used. It's sort of like turning your song into a puzzle that the audience could sort of unravel in their mind. Uh, the music was polyphonic and homophonic. It had chords, very full sound. Uh, Oddly enough, there was a lot of vocal music that was a cappella, particularly in the church. Now, a cappella, we think, means without a piano or without a guitar or something like that. The word a cappella actually means for the chapel, because in the chapels, that was a small church attached to a large church. And in that chapel was where they had meetings, small services, uh, choir practice, but they had no instruments. So the chapel a cappella there was no instruments. And pretty soon, they would hear people singing without it, and they thought, oh, that's a cappella music because it has no instruments. It was really a, a cappella. It was a chapel where they had no instruments. But we have let that word stick down through history. Um, there's a couple of words there that I didn't highlight on this, but I do want to throw them out. Uh, Pasamezzo, Antico, and Modero. Pasamezzo, Antico is one of the oldest progressions. If you've ever heard the song Green Sleeves, it's an example of the Passamezzo Antico. Uh, and believe it or not, there's a lot of songs written with the same chord pattern as Green Sleeves. So that if you hear Green Sleeves and it doesn't sound the same, it's just another variation of this technique or chord program, Passamezzo Antico. The Passamezzo Moderno uh, is a little different. But we find, and the reason I point this out, is the composers began to come up with these styles and set formulas that they followed. Later, we will find that Mozart gave us a chord formula that if you use it, you come up with uh, a beautiful song almost every time. Uh, but we'll talk about that in the class here. Uh, I listed some Renaissance composers here. Uh, I may put some of their pieces. Primarily, these guys wrote what was known as madrigals and motets, which are the two main vocal forms. But Orlando Gibbons, Giovanni Pierluigi, Orlando de Lassus, and Claudio Monteverdi. Monteverdi uh, is a little different because he really is the first opera composer. Uh, gave us opera late in the Renaissance. A lot of people think it was created in the Italian school around the 18th century, or 15th, 14th, pardon me, 16th century. But no, it was Monteverdi. Um, then on the next slide, slide 24, you see sacred and secular music because they still had the two camps. The church was still powerful. They had sacred music. And what they had was a thing called the motet. And you'll see that highlighted on this slide. A motet was a vocal form. It had four more melodic lines. Uh, 
I mentioned Josquin de Pre, who was the leading writer of motets. They're always sacred in nature. And at the same time, in secular music, you have a thing called the madrigal. Uh, now, the madrigal was a motet, just not sacred. So if I had a motet, I could take the same music, change the words, and it becomes a madrigal. Likewise, if I had a madrigal, take the same music, change the words to a sacred story, and I've got a motet. And you see wedged in between the motet and the madrigal is the mass, because the mass is still prominent. It is the church worship service. But now something begins to change as all composers think, well, I'm going to write a mass. And it became sort of like a test of your abilities to write a mass. That's still true today. Uh, I had a friend at Rice University who was a composition major. And I asked him, I said, what are you going to do? He said, well, I want to write an opera and I want to write a mass. And I thought, you're not even Catholic. But that was a musical form. It started here in the Renaissance as people began to spread their wings, so to speak. Now, these two guys right here, not very flattering pictures, but you see Josquin de Pre. He is the leading motet composer. He focused almost entirely on sacred music, not completely, but almost. And then, oddly enough, the leading madrigal com composer, which is secular music, he got his picture put on a stained glass window in the Chichester Cathedral in England. So it's odd that he wrote madrigals, but he's glorified by the church. But these two guys sort of laid down a foundation for all future vocal music. The Prey and um, Thomas Weeks, I forgot to tell you his name. It looks like Welks, but it's pronounced Weeks. Thomas Weeks and Josquin de Prey were the leading vocal composers of their day. Uh, one from Advocates, one from Motes. Now, the final slide, 26, uh, actually is not totally the final slide, but you'll see the terms. And I'm going to create a test that uses these terms for def defining and then some questions. And all of the answers are within this PowerPoint. So you can listen to this lecture or you can go back and read the PowerPoint. That'll be the test of this thing. The end of this PowerPoint, the uh, Renaissance instruments, which I also had in the Middle Ages, but it's to show you these instruments, which are very interesting. You can just look through them. And if you have the time and, and you're interested, go through on your internet, look them up, and you'll find out samples of how they sounded. But this was an age of creativity, and so they became creative with their instruments. And like I said, I'm looking at the PowerPoint that you as students will be able to download and look at. Um, but that basically sums up the Renaissance. It was a time of expansion right up until the Protestant Reformation, and the Reformation brought everything to a grinding halt. Uh, it will sort of develop later, but what we have later will be the Italian school, will be the leading school of music. Then you will have the English school of madrigals and the German school, which a lot of people thought the Germans was too harsh. But all that's coming in the next period, which will be called the Baroque period. But for now, we're going to deal with the Renaissance. So I want you to look at this. I'll post some stuff online and you can get busy with it. I hope you enjoy it. The Renaissance, from my way of thinking, is one of the most important periods, not only in musical, but in Western civilization history, because it's they throw off the, I guess you'd say, the, the ties and binds of the church, and they open themselves up for possibilities. They didn't throw the church out. People mistake that, you know, they were all like nasty enough. The church was still a key power influence on their spiritual life. But now they had philosophical influences on their physical lives. And it was pretty good. I mean, I didn't even talk to you about the guild system where people were learning a trade and a skill, opening their own businesses. Uh, but this is a music class, not just necessarily a business class. But on your own, if you'd like to study that, it's, it's interesting to look into. But I'm going to leave you with that, and I hope you enjoy it. Thanks.